I'm Malik Hook from the University of Colorado, and this is the second edition of One Slide in Five Minutes. The topic today involves the elevation of primary selective laser trabeculoplasty, or SLT, from a side consideration to a therapeutic approach that is much more common. The laser in glaucoma and ocular hypertension study, also known as the LIGHT study, recruited consecutive newly referred patients who were identified at six hospitals across the UK between 2012 and 2014, and the study duration was 36 months. Eligible patients had newly diagnosed untreated open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension in one or both eyes. Humphrey visual field mean deviation requirement was no worse than minus 12 decibels in the better eye or minus 15 decibels in the worse eye and corresponding damage to the optic nerve. It is important to note that clinicians and patients were not masked to the specific treatment arm. However, all measurements influencing treatment decisions, including visual field, optic disc imaging, and intraocular pressure measurements, were made by clinicians masked to treatment allocation. In both groups, patient mean age was 62 to 63 years. Most patients were Caucasian. Most eyes were phacic, and only a small subset of the open angle glaucoma patients had pseudoexfoliation. Of note, pigmentary glaucoma patients were not included. IOP goal was determined from both a percentage reduction, 20 or 30% depending on disease status, from a single untreated baseline measurement. SLT treatment was completed over 360 degrees of the trabecular meshwork using 100 non-overlapping shots with the laser energy ranging between 0.3 and 1.4 millijoules. Laser energy was to be titrated to observation of cavitation bubbles, and then the energy was decreased until bubbles were barely observable at least 50% of the time. Retreatment with SLT was allowed once if the initial treatment was noted to result in some lowering of IOP after the initial treatment. For the medical therapy arm, first line was prostaglandin analogs followed by beta blockers, carbonic anhydrous inhibitors, and alpha agonists. Data for the primary outcome were available for 652 or 91% of the 718 patients at 36 months, 92% in the SLT group and 89% in the eye drops group. Overall, 95% of eyes treated with SLT were at target IOP at 36 months. Target IOP was achieved without IOP medications in 78.2% of the eyes treated in the SLT group, and of these, 76.6 required only one treatment. A total of 74.2% of the patients in the SLT group were not using any drops at the 36-month visit. And to me, that's one of the most important points. The majority of patients post-SLT didn't need drops for an extended period of time. In comparison, 93.1% of the eyes treated in the eye drops group were at target IOP at 36 months, and 64.6% .6 of the patients were only using one medication. 36 eyes in the eye drops group had disease deterioration. In the SLT group, 23 eyes had disease deterioration. One key finding was the requirement for glaucoma surgery, in this case trabeculectomy, in 11 eyes or 1.8% in the eye drops group, compared with none in the SLT group. There was a lack of quality of life differences between groups, which might be attributed to the type of questionnaire used, which focus more on disease progression and disease effect rather than treatment effect. The authors concluded that primary SLT is a cost-effective alternative to drops that can be offered to patients with open-angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension needing treatment to lower IOP. There are two follow-up studies that I think are worth mentioning in the LIGHT study. The first one is a study by Wright and colleagues and they looked at differences in visual field progression between the two groups in the LIGHT study and found using total deviation values that one in four eyes in the medication group showed moderate or fast visual field progression, whereas in the SLT group this value was approximately one in six. The authors concluded, and I quote, with slower visual field deterioration, SLT may delay or completely avert the need for more intense medical and surgical intervention in a significant proportion of patients. The second study by Garg and colleagues set to determine the efficacy of repeat SLT in the LIGHT study in patients requiring repeat treatment for early to medium-term failure of initial SLT treatment. Median duration of survival post-repeat SLT could not be determined because 50% of these eyes did not reach the endpoint within the 18-month follow-up period although available data showed that median duration of survival in this group was at least 18 months. This is strong evidence that repeat SLT should be considered much earlier than I would have considered in the past, and that outcomes post-repeat SLT can be clinically meaningful as well as long-lasting and may obviate the need for adding drops or needing surgery to lower IOP for an extended period of time. My personal conclusion is that I should be offering more primary SLT to treatment-naive patients compared to what I have done in the past, and I would welcome future exploration of adding SLT versus medications in patients already on one or two drops when treatment escalation is needed. Consider visiting the following educational resources, including keogt.com, and I thank you for your time.